day, we ended with a discussion of Bhumandala. And so now we need to continue that. Uh, I should make some points concerning... We were discussing to some extent this appendix by Vamsidar, so I should clarify a few points with regard to that. The... Uh, view that I take on Vamsidar's presentation uh, is given here. I say we should state clearly here that we do not think that his analysis is entirely correct. Let's say in the beginning here. The main purpose in presenting this is to show that at a time before the advent of any European influence in India, the question of the Earth as a small globe versus the idea of the Earth given Srimad Bhagavatam as the Bhumandala disk was being discussed by Vaishnavas in our Sampradaya. So this Vamsidhar is an, an example of that. And as you can see in his presentation, this uh, was a controversial question at that time. Uh, people were perplexed about it. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, solutions to this problem that he mentioned there is that you should use the principle of uh, anirvachaniya, which we've uh, heard of in another context. Uh, he just mentions that as one of a list of different explanations. So the main point is that this issue was being discussed back in the uh, early 1600s, uh, which is the time when he was living. And that's about apparently the time of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Do we have any dates on Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur? Yeah, I just wonder what his exact dates might be. So, we were speaking about the cosmic scale of Bhumandala. So, uh, I want to give some presentation of that. Oh, we have an eraser. Oh, it seems we have a, uh, an artistic tesseract here. Uh, this is what it should look like. Four-dimensional uh, cube or hypercube. We also have a one-dimensional simulation of <laughs> dimensional space. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what I want to do is uh, give some idea of the uh, scale of this uh, room mandala. And I'm going to try to do this with some drawings here see how well this works. This is a cross section of Bhu Mandala. And this is the center. So this is Jamudweep right here. This is radially going out. So you imagine this extends on the other side also. So the uh, to get an idea of the dimensions, if we from here out to here is about uh, 250 million uh, yojanas, or about 2 billion miles, using 8 miles per yojana. So that's the distance from here to the outer edge. That's the radius of the Bhumandala disk. That's the radius of the Bhumandala disk. So, because the diameter would be 500 million yojanas, or 4 billion miles. So halfway, there's something called the Loka Loka Mountain. Now, Bhumandala is, everything in Bhumandala is arranged in, in circular form. So, if this is Bhumandala and this is the center, then the Loka Loka mountain runs in a circle with a radius pattern of the radius of uh, Bhumandala. So, it's described that the region out here between here and here, which would be this region, that's called Aloka Varsha. And it's a region of perpetual darkness. There's no sunlight there and there are no inhabitants. That's what Aloka means, no people. Yeah. So that's Aloka uh, Varsha. This mountain, uh, Loka Loka Mountain, it's the boundary between the Loka and the Aloka. Mm -hmm. Hence it has that name and it blocks the sunlight. 
that description is given. So there's nothing, there's no light out in this region. So if we go in, so this has a distance of, uh, this is another unit, 125 uh, million yojinus. That's that. That's half of the radius. So then, you go into about here, roughly speaking, and there's a region like this. This would be 82.2 million yojinus. This is the region of the Golden Land, it is called. There's an interesting description in the Bhagavatam. So that's another circular region lying within here. So now that's this region. Uh, this is also uninhabited. It's described that the nature of this region is that everything is a blaze of light so that you can't distinguish anything. And no one can live there. That's the, the golden land. It's as though you're living on a surface of polished gold, like a mirror surface. And you can't see anything because of all the, the light. Now, next we come to the uh, a region of inhabited land. Let's see. This, you divide this up, it's about like this in proportion. This would be, uh, okay, 15.75 million uh, yojanas. Uh, this is the region from the outer edge of the clear water ocean to the beginning of the golden land, and that's called inhabited land. That's the description that's given. So that's yet another circle. Then, do the Sanskrit terms for these uh, divisions also? Yes, they're all in the in the bottom of town. Uh, apart from, yeah, you can look them them up. I don't know them right offhand. So. This point here, at the beginning of this, is the far shore of the clear water ocean. So now, to describe what's going on inside here, uh, one has to expand out this diagram. Uh, so now this point becomes the same as, as this point. We've expanded the scale. So within this radial region, there's the uh, seven dweepas and seven ring-shaped uh, oceans. So uh, the important, really important thing to note is that at a certain point here, in the outer ring, which is called Pushkara Dweep, there is a ring-shaped mountain called Manasotara Mountain. So that would be here, another smaller ring. And this diagram is quite small now. And this is going to be of interest because this ring-shaped Manasotra mountain is the uh, path followed by the sun. So we're going to be talking about that uh, in some detail. Inside the Kerala Ocean? No, it's exactly in the middle of Pushkara Dweep, which is inside the Clearwater Ocean. So what you have is the Clearwater Ocean and then Pushkara Dweep and halfway across Pushkara Dweep, radially, is Manasotra Mountain, which is a ring going all the way around. So going inwards, you have successive oceans and mountains. And each one is half, as you go in, each pair of oceans and mountains has half the width of the preceding one. Until finally, you come down to Plaksha Dweep, which is the smallest ring-shaped island Within that is the saltwater ocean, which is the smallest ring-shaped ocean. And then in the center of that, there's a circular island called Jambudri. And we were looking yesterday in the pictures, the computer-generated pictures in the book, which show what Jambudri looks like. So the main point is that on the scale of this picture, Jambudri here is very tiny, just like a tiny region in the center of this large structure. Actually, that's half, that, what you've drawn those two braces there, that's actually half of that one. Yeah, I haven't drawn it to scale. A little, yeah. little more than half. Either. Yeah, I haven't drawn it to scale. To give the, the figures correctly, 
from Mount Montefortura, which is here, to give the scale, there's 9.6 million Yojanas between Montefortura Mountain and the outer edge of the Clearwater Ocean. And from Montefortura Mountain to the center, which is Jambu, the center of Jambudwi, which would be the center of Mount Meru, there's once again 15.75 uh, million Yojanas. So you can see this is, you know, uh, about two thirds of this. So I haven't drawn it to proper scale. But that is the uh, the arrangement. So uh, at this point, there's a, an interesting observation to make uh, concerning the scale of this system, and that is that the Bhagavatam pretty much has the distance from the Earth, which is at the center. Uh, we'll be discussing how uh, our location would be in Bharat Varsha in Jammu, so we would be located near the center of this whole structure. So the distance then from the Earth to the Sun, the Earth as we know it to the Sun, of course I should emphasize in the Bhagavatam this whole thing is the Earth, but the Earth as a small planet as we experience, the distance from that to the Sun, would be given here as uh, 15.75 uh, million uh, yojanas. Now if you use, uh, as we've said the yojana is variable. But if you use uh, five miles per yojana, what you get is that this comes out to 78.75 million miles. I'll use that for million miles. Uh, and if you use eight miles per yojana, it's 126 million miles. And also another figure for the yojana that I've seen is six miles. I'll just put that one in for the sake of argument, you get 94.5 million miles. In any case, according to modern science, the distance from the Earth to the Sun is about 93 million miles. So, it's just interesting that the, the Bhagavatam seems to have the scale right as far as modern science goes. Yeah? And what's the Jyoti Shastra figure? The Jyoti Shastra, that's the whole thing to discuss. It does not give a figure for the distance to the sun that agrees with the modern scientific It should be the other way around, if anything. You might think. Now, um, I probably would have to give a whole lecture to properly discuss distances to planets in the Surya Siddhanta, in the Jyotish uh, Shastra. I'd like to do that, too, but I suspect that there are other more important things to, to cover first. But uh, there are interesting issues there. Uh, some of that is discussed in that first chapter that you read toward the end of the chapter. Yeah, so it's uh, interesting that the scale more or less agrees. So this is the description of uh, Bhumandala. One thing I should point out also with regard to the Jyotish Shastra is that the uh, historical astronomers who've written works in this field of Jyotish Shastra uh, have generally shown a lack of appreciation of the fifth canto description of the universe. Uh, for example, this uh, Parameshwara uh, said that the seven dvipas, as we're describing here, are only for religious meditation. <laughs> said, well, they're not real. Uh, as for Mount Meru, he said it's not acceptable to astronomers. Uh, and there are some other uh, cases like that. This is the Siddhanta Shiromani by this Bhaskaracharya. And he, for example, is describing here how they measure the uh, circumference of the earth. Uh, this tells how they would actually do it in India. Uh, he's saying specifically that you would measure the uh, distance from Ujjain to a point to the south of that and see the change in the angle of the sun. Ujjain, by the way, is the prime meridian uh, used by the uh, Indian astronomers. Just like Greenwich in England marks the prime meridian uh, in modern astronomy. So you uh, measure uh, a distance going north-south and you see how much the angle of the sun changes if you cover that distance. 
uh, at a given date. And based on that, you can calculate the circumference of the Earth. The way it works is this. If uh, this is the Earth, the sphere, and sunlight is coming down in parallel rays, <coughs> so if you, if this is the center, let's say the way I've drawn it right here, the sun at this time would be right overhead. And here the sun at this time would be at this angle, which must be the same as this angle. If you uh, measure this distance along the surface of the Earth, and you know this angle, then you can find what the radius of the Earth is. So that's the method that they used. So he's describing that method, and he gives the figure, uh, which agrees pretty much with the, the modern figure for the diameter of the Earth. And then he says, what reason then is there in attributing, as the Puranicas do, such an immense magnitude to the Earth? He's referring to this description of Umandala. So uh, there was also a lack of understanding on their part of the situation of Bhumandala. So what I want to do today is go step by step to explain the situation of Bhumandala. So, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Very quickly, you mentioned uh, when Mount Nehru and saw some or other seem like they're interchanging that with Jambadu. Could you quickly state the relationship between Mount Nehru and yeah, that's easy seen most easily if you look at this picture, which is on page uh, 52. So that is a picture of Jambudweet, and Mount Meru is the inverted cone-like structure that you see in the center. And what's Mount is West Jambudweet? The whole thing is Jambudweet, including Mount Meru. What the whole thing being what's in that circle? Uh, everything in that picture is Jambudweet. The whole. The, the totality of that picture. Oh, Jamadu is like the inner circle, the inner part of the disk of Bumanda. Yeah. The idea here is that you have these ring-shaped oceans and islands, just to make another diagram. This just looks like a bullseye. But basically, you have the rings going in, getting smaller and smaller as you go in. And finally, in the very center, there's a disk. It's in the pre on the previous page, page 51. Right. If you look on the previous page, you get a perspective view, and you see who Mandala is situated within that series of rings. Jambudvi is situated. Uh, Jambudvi. Yeah. So that's the situation. And the Earth globe is where in relation to Mount Sumeru? So that is what we want to now discuss. Now, as I pointed out, just at the very end of the, the class yesterday, to get an idea of scale, if you again look at the picture on page uh, 53, you'll see a mountain range that goes from A to B, marked there. The height of that mountain range is about twice the diameter of the Earth as we know it. Uh, it's a mountain range that's, uh, well, it's uh, 2,000 yojanas high, and 8 miles per yojana is at 16,000 miles high. The diameter of the Earth is about 8,000 miles. So that's the height of that mountain range. So this uh, Buma, this Jambudweep structure is enormous in comparison. Now, in order to understand Bhumandala, uh, certainly uh, our location has something to do with Bhumandala, that much you can say, because in Bhumandala there's something called Bharata Varsha. And uh, so there are nine Varshas in Bhumandala which are divided by these different mountain ranges. And actually there's this central square region that you can see that has Mount Meru growing up from it. That's called the Labata Varsha. And if you count the divisions made by these mountain ranges, counting that square as one of them, you'll see that there are nine. And Bhumandala is shown more closely on page 55 to be a sort of semicircular region on the southern uh, side of this disk. So that is the, the description that is given. Now, in the Bhagavatam, it is described that the inhabitants of the marshes other than Bhumandala 
are all um, beings similar to demigods. It's described that they're not quite demigods. Actually, they are persons who had nearly exhausted their karma on the heavenly planets. They were demigods. So having nearly exhausted their karma, they come down to these other dvipas of uh, other varshas of Jambudvip, but they still have basically uh, good karma to exhaust. So they, it said that they live for 10,000 years and their bodies do not show symptoms of old age uh, and bad odor and so on and so forth. Uh, also, uh, the, these varshas are generally playgrounds for the demigods. All kinds of events involving the, the demigods take place there, including a lot of different things mentioned in the Mahabharata, for example. So these regions are not exactly earthly. Uh, they're more like celestial domains. And it's described that the uh, Kali Yuga does not have a real impact in these other Varshas. Uh, in general, the Kali Yuga only affects Bharata Varsha to a severe degree. It just has a very slight effect in these other regions. Furthermore, it's described that Bharata Varsha is the region where one can uh, uh, accrue karma and where one can attain liberation. Uh, in these other regions, typically, one is simply exhausting the results of uh, pious deeds done in the past. And uh, generally, they're just gradually gliding downward karmically. Yeah? Where, where is this that you're describing? All of the regions on this blue mandala, except for Bharat Varsha, which we described here, are what I'm describing here. So like the, the uh, innermost ranges? Well, like the innermost region and these two side pieces, uh, uh, you know, like here <coughs> and here. One of them is called Bhadrashva Varsha, and so on. And these sort of more narrow strips here, uh, and on this side also. Uh, these are all regions in which uh, basically it's sort of the tail end of demigod life is being experienced. Uh, there is a term that's found in the, uh, the Bhagavatam known as Bala Sparga, which is interesting. <coughs> it said that there are three kinds of heavens. Uh, there is Sparga proper, which is the region of Indra and the different demigods. Sparga Loka. So that's an upper planetary system. Then there's Bauma Sparga, which is the earthly heavenly region. So that consists of all of the Varshas of Jambudvi plus the uh, other six Dvipas in uh, Saptadvi. Uh, so that is called the earthly heaven. And then there's something called Bila Sparga, which is the uh, lower heaven. Uh, it's interesting, there are lower heavenly regions which are inhabited by demonic personalities who have a very high standard of material opulence. For example, uh, Maya Dhanava lives in Bila Sparga and it's described that he has very ideal material conditions. It's sort of like the ultimate in a wealthy suburb. Uh, sort of like La Foya around San Diego, I'm sure. But, uh, uh, so it's interesting that these different regions, apart from Bhumandala, are all referred to as, as heavens. So uh, that means then that we must be in Bhumandala. But there's, uh, there are some problems there. First of all, there's a problem of scale, because the Earth as we experience it is very minute compared to the, the total size of, of, uh, of uh, Bharat Varsha. So the basic proposal that I am making is that the relationship between the earth globe of our experience and the structure of Jambudweep is of this higher dimensional nature that I was discussing uh, yesterday. So the idea is that uh, the, the total system is higher dimensional and one can experience it at different levels of perception. Now. In the Bhagavatam, there are uh, descriptions of uh, correspondences between uh, the parts of, uh, I keep saying Bhumandala, I mean Bharat Varsha 
as we know it, <coughs> namely in India and so forth, on this earth globe, and uh, regions within uh, Jambudweep and Bharat Varsha in uh, Jambudweep. So these uh, correspondences come up in various uh, purports in Srila Prabhupada's uh, books in different places, and I have uh, listed some of them uh, in this chapter, number three here. But uh, what you will find, for example, is Srila Prabhupada describes that uh, Bharat Varsha used to be the entire Earth planet. Uh, that's one thing that comes up in a number of different reports. In addition to that, there are descriptions in several places that certain kings ruled uh, all of Bharat Varsha, which in that case would include all of the Earth planet. But then there are descriptions that some kings uh, ruled uh, all of Jambudvi. And yet there are other descriptions of kings who ruled uh, all the seven islands, Saptadvipa. And there's one case, namely Maharaj Priyabrata, in which it seems that he was ruling the entire universe. Srila Prabhupada said in one purport that it's very hard to understand where Maharaj Priyabrata was situated. Uh, because it seemed to be the entire universe. So, the uh, situation that you seem to have there is that in different periods of history, there are different degrees of access. In one case, you'll have a king ruling in India who is, uh, has access to all of Bhumandala, all seven dvipas. In other cases, it's just Jambudri. In other cases, it's just Bharat Varsha. So in Kali Yuga of today, there's a very limited scope of uh, activity. But in other uh, periods, different yugas and so forth, there was evidently uh, a much larger scope of activity to varying degrees. It's also described that specific uh, places on the earth correspond to uh, places in the higher planets. By the way, Srila Prabhupada uses the term higher planets to refer to this general Jambudweep system. For example, he has spoken of Mount Meru as being on a higher planet. He has spoken of the Gandamandana Hill, which forms one of the boundaries between two of these Varshas as being on a higher planet and so forth. So, uh, let's see here. Just to illustrate some of this. Uh, interesting point here is that uh, communication between this earth planet and the seven dvipas is still going on today according to the Chaitanya Charitamrita. You can read there that uh, human beings, uh, not human beings, but beings from the different dvipas of Sapta Dvip visited Lord Chaitanya during his pastimes disguised as human beings. So these kinds of things are going on. As far as this idea of a principle of correspondence is concerned, let's see here. Some of the things that I just mentioned are listed here or discussed on page 57. Where were these other things? One thing I wanted to discuss that was interesting to me is the idea that rivers on the earth have celestial counterparts. Srila Prabhupada in one place, this was in a uh, purport in the section of the Bhagavatam discussing the uh, slaying of Ritrasura. He pointed out that all of the different major rivers flowing in India, uh, not just the Ganges, but the Narmada River and various others, uh, have their counterparts in the heavenly planets. So there were descriptions of battles that took place on the heavenly planets along the shores of rivers, but those rivers are in India. So the uh, basic thesis that I would propose is that the uh, total structure that you have here is this structure described briefly in the fifth canto, but this can be seen at different levels of perception in different ways. Uh, there are more limited levels of perception and 
uh, more expansive levels, uh, which depend then on the karmic situation of the individuals, and also the cycle of the yugas can be involved in this, this being Kali Yuga. So, in this way, you have the, uh, the earth being experienced by us as a small globe, but in a higher dimensional sense that is connected to this larger structure of Bhu Mandala. The basic thesis that I'm proposing is that uh, Bhu Mandala is a description of the universe as seen from the point of view of the demigods and rishis and so forth. And the small earth globe as we know it and as described in the Jyotisha Shastras corresponds to the earth in the experience of ordinary human beings like ourselves. In Kali Yuga. Yeah, like in Kali Yuga. Yeah? So is this, um, you're saying that, ka- that the karmic, somebody say karmic um, bank account for their, how much karma they have kind of grows in quantums because everyone on this planet is experiencing the planet as a sphere. Mm-hmm. It says that everyone on this planet must fall into the same category of some certain range of karma in yeah. order to be having this level of sense perception. Yes, that, that would be correct. There's group karma, you might say. And it does go by quantums, quantum jumps. And the point where the quantum jump is made is when you die and get another body. Uh, because depending on the karma that you've accrued in the course of one lifetime, at the time of death you could be promoted to a higher planet. So in effect you make a quantum leap at that point. Or you could be demoted to a lower one. So it's not exactly that there's a continuum of possibilities. There are quantum jumps there. Yeah? Now, if, if, the, if the Earth planet, if you know it as a, as a, as a circle, um, if, as like you were describing, then what happens in, in the other part of, uh, of uh, Bharata Vasa, the other part of the Sun circle, how is it... Um, um, how is it situated? Or, or there are in- inhabitants and... Because like, they are distributed of, of the Bhagavatam of the other uh, Varshas. Yes. So the Bhagavatam describes all the Varshas in terms of this basic geographical structure shown here. So I've made the point thus far that at least part of that, namely part of Bharat Varsha, can be experienced by its inhabitants as being a globe detached from everything else. Now, it is interesting that Srila Prabhupada uses this kind of description for all of Bhumandala. And uh, I collected together examples of that. Basically, we see how Bhumandala is described in the Bhagavatam. That's what we're discussing here. Srila Prabhupada describes it as a system of globes. And since that is an interesting point, let me look at the page reference where I have that discussed. Hmm. I would have thought that I had good notes here. Here we go. 71 through 72 in the book. There's a section called Planets as Globes in Space. <coughs> so, uh, Srila Prabhupada refers to the whole system in terms of globes in space, and I have well, about seven different references here. Uh, yeah? The idea of um, the idea that it's simultaneous with globes in space and also a plane is similar to the idea of the atom being simultaneously perceived as a particle and a wave in one sense, but as two, two levels of... Uh, yeah, you can make an analogy like that, and that analogy is backed up in one sense because in order to explain the atom in that way, the physicists actually use a higher dimensional scheme. As I was saying yesterday, in quantum mechanics, you use higher dimensional space to define atoms. So that whole wave-particle duality and all the different things you find in quantum mechanics is really expressed in terms of higher dimensions. So, in any event, uh, the idea of, from different points of view, you have either this uh, structure as described in the Bhagavatam or you have systems of globes. Uh, That is there in Srila Prabhupada's descriptions uh, here is one. This is from the Krishna book. I'll just read this. Uh, this is where Arjuna and Krishna were going to visit Maha Vishnu. So it says, seated on his chariot with Arjuna, Krishna began to proceed north, 
crossing over many planetary systems. I should, by the way, describe where they were traveling. North would mean towards the North Pole Star, which is the direction of Satya Loka. And if you imagine Gu Mandala, then it's spread out beneath them as they travel upwards. So they'll get a panoramic view as they go up. So, Srila Prabhupada says, these are described, the planetary systems, are described in Srimad Bhagavatam as Sapta Dwipa. So that's the Sapta Dwipa. Dwipa means island. These planets are sometimes described in the Vedic literature as Dwipas. The planet on which we are living is called Jambu Dwipa. Outer space is taken as a great ocean of air, and within that great ocean of air there are many islands which are the different planets. In each and every planet there are oceans also, and so on. So there he's describing uh, Saptadweep in terms of islands in, in the ocean of air. Uh, here's another reference. This is from Chaitanya Char Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, is a reference here. By the way, in reading this book, uh, it's useful if you look up these different references that I have in brackets, because then you'll see what Srila Prabhupada said in the original references. But here's another one. He says, uh, the planets are called Dwipas. Outer space is like an ocean of air. Just as there are islands in the watery ocean, these planets in the ocean of space are called Dwipas, or islands uh, in outer space. And so there are uh, oh, here's one. This one is interesting. Number four here. I'll just read part of it. It says that uh, this is in five five one fifth canto part one. But uh, as Priyavrata drove his chariot behind the sun, he created seven different types of oceans and planetary systems, which all together are known as Bhu Mandala or Bhu Loka. And there again, he was saying sometimes the planets in outer space are called islands. Uh, and these are islands in the ocean of space. So it's basically the idea here of a planet as an island floating in the ocean of air or the ocean of space. Uh, he explicitly refers to them as globes also. Uh, there's some other references here. So this gives, in a way, this all adds up into a sort of unified picture of things. If you consider that you have the uh, description of this Bhumandala system in Bhagavatam described in this way, including Jambudvi. And that is also understandable as a series of globes or a system of planets floating in space. So the idea then is that uh, one can make sense out of this in terms of the this higher dimensional uh, concept. Yeah? Um. The geography of Bhu Mandala with the circular rings mm -hmm. like islands and so on suggests the idea that um, the system of globes would be nest, nested one inside the other with a common center. I'm sure you must have thought of that and dismissed it as a possibility. Well, I thought of it, but uh, what I thought was I can't really do much more with it in the sense that I don't have any information to go on there. But, you see, basically we have somewhat limited information. Uh, at least we have this much information here. Uh, but in terms of the details of how it's all laid out, uh, of course I don't really know. But, uh, so let's see. So I then wanted to, to go on with the description here. So we have this Okay. Who model a disc, which I'm claiming is higher dimensional, and it can also be experienced as a series of globes. Uh, but as far as modern observation is concerned, if you look out into space from the Earth, uh, you'll see stars in all directions. You don't see such a system of globes. Of course, there's certain other globes floating out there, but those are uh, Mercury and Venus and Mars and so forth, and the Sun and the Moon. Uh, there are just a few of them, and they have names. They are also named in the Bhagavatam, so they are not Bhumandala. They are quite distinct from it, because they are separately described in the Bhagavatam. So then where is this Bhumandala? Uh, so that's what I want to discuss next. 
So if you look into outer space, you see stars in all directions. Can you make clear what you're saying? You're saying Mercury, Venus, and Mars are not part of Umakot? Right, they're not, because they're separately described in the fifth canto. That is, it talks about Venus, Mercury, Mars, and so on, but they're not Umandala, they're something different. Uh, so they're all described. Their paths or orbits are described with reference to Umandala. And that's what I want to come to. I think I'll be able to get to it today. But you have until six. Yeah, I have until six, right. Yeah? Those planets are described as globes? Mercury, Mars, etc.? Yes. Uh, actually, it doesn't explicitly say that they're, they're globes, although I, I think it's taken for granted. In the uh, Surya Siddhanta, they're definitely said to be globes. But the Surya Siddhanta tends to accept that in general. Right. The Bhagavatam refers to them as Graha. Uh, the word for those planets is Graha. As I was saying before, there are two words that Srila Prabhupada translates as planet generally. Loka is one of them, and Graha is the other. And as I was saying, it, that has astrological significance. It refers to the power of the planet to influence you. It grabs you, is the idea. This is what, I, what I'm thinking is that although I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be true, it seems like uh, within the Puranic view, there maybe should be some consistency of how things are viewed in terms of these disks of land. And within the Jyoti Shastra, there's the consistency of always seeing it as globes in space. Yeah, well, the Puranic system has more disks than just the mandala. There are 14 of them. But there might be globes involved in the scene also. Yeah, uh, there could be. In fact, Srila Prabhupada says that with regard to all 14 of them. That's one that I didn't read in this list here. He refers to all 14 of these planetary systems in terms of globes in space. But basically, in the Bhagavatam, they're like planes. Uh, so especially the lower ones, the lower planetary systems are all named Pala. There's Pakala, Sutala, Mahapala. We have the word Pala, is a Pali, a plate. <laughs> so that's what they are, they're discs, they're plates. That's common in the Maladi, that word? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Because one is T-H and the other is T-H. Well, I don't know. But Tala definitely means a, a flat plate. And uh, so that's the uh, the etymology there as far as I'm aware. So... But, um, maybe I wasn't clear. I mean, even from this higher dimensional viewpoint, mm -hmm. some of these entities are still remaining as close. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. From the viewpoint. You see, the, uh, especially for the higher planets, the Puranas don't even really say what shape it has. At least the Bhagavatam doesn't. Uh, what is Indraloka like in terms of its layout? It doesn't really tell us. Or uh, Sparga Loka, well that's Indraloka, and uh, you know, Mahara Loka, Jana Loka, and so on. Uh, so, what I'm proposing basically is there are different ways of experiencing these things. Uh, just to give some other examples, uh, just like you think of the Earth as a globe and we experience it that way. But suppose you could actually go to Vrindavan and experience the whole uh, Galoka Vrindavan present there. Then you wouldn't be experiencing the Earth as a globe. You'd be going there and seeing this infinite, unlimitedly expanded region, which hardly would fit in the Earth in an ordinary sense. So with that level of experience, you wouldn't be experiencing the Earth as a globe. So I'm just proposing that in general, that is the, the way it is. Or, uh, to take a mundane example, if you take one of these yogis who can reach out with his prapti city, let's say he reaches, as Prabhupada said in the nectar of devotion there in the beginning, and touches the moon with his finger. Uh, so to him, the moon is right there. So the whole structure of things as he experiences it is different. And so the basic idea is that there, the, the total structure of reality is a sort of multi-level, multiply connected, or higher dimensional system. And depending on how Krishna sets up your particular sensory situation, you can experience it in different ways. Right. I understand that, but I'm just wondering if there's consistency within a particular level of perception. Yeah. Beyond that, I don't know. Okay. This is... Uh, 
as much as I know. Yeah? In that Yeah. And woke up and everything has shrunk? Well, yeah, that's the, what happens with the advent of Kali Yuga. Well, the, the different living beings don't grow as much. That's the impression I have there. They become stunted in their growth. Yeah? Uh, does Mount Sumeru go into any other uh, mandalas? Or is it just... It's part of Bumandala. It's described as being part of Bumandala. Then the residences yeah. of the demigods on top of it are definitely distinct from the heavenly planets where the demigod, where yes. the demigods are. It's like a king having a summer palace, as far as I can understand. Uh, because, for example, Brahma, obviously, is living in Brahma Loka. And then he has his city on the top of Mount Meru. Yeah? Is there a significance that uh, uh, Mount Sumeru is cone shape while all around there is a regular mountain type uh, ranges? Well, it's clearly different from an ordinary mountain. <laughs> <laughs> we, we call it Mount Sumeru, but it's certainly not like any ordinary mountain. There's no significance attached to that? There may be. Like a crystal? There may be. I only know so much. Yeah. It doesn't give a very clear account of how big the moon is. Yeah. So, uh, to continue, let's see if I can uh, get through to some of these points. Uh, we, if we ask where Bhu Mandala is, uh, you can think of it this way. Think of it again as a disk, which is the simplest image. Now, we're at the center of that disk. Somehow that much is clear. And it's a very big disk. It goes out two billion miles. So that means most of it is very far away from us, out in space. So if you imagine sitting on a disk like that, that disk is going to be like a plane bisecting space into two halves. Now I talked the other day about the celestial sphere. So that would cut the celestial sphere in half along a great circle. So that means to say where Bumambula is, you'd want to say what great circle on the celestial sphere does that correspond to? That would be the, the way you'd approach that question. So there are different possibilities. The first one to deal with is what you could call the naive flat earth hypothesis. Now according, <laughs> according to this idea, Bumandala must mean the plane of the horizon. The idea is that people were thinking the earth was flat and it's just a plane so then that's the plane of the horizon. So that's what Bumandala is. Now, this won't work though, because uh, ultimately the reason for that has to do with the motion of the sun. The sun moves along the plane of Bumandala in a big circle. In fact, well, I erased it. It moves on this uh, Manasotara mountain, which is a ring. So we'd be in the center and it moves on that ring. So, if you think of that, that would mean the sun would be at some point on the horizon and it would just move around on the horizon. It would never go up <laughs> like this. Uh, as a curious indication of the way people think, Bhaskar Acharya criticizes uh, the Puranas on that very basis. He thinks, that, thinks that's what they must be saying. So he says, if this blessed earth were level like a plain mirror, then why is not the sun revolving above at a distance from the earth uh, visible at all times, etc.? So, uh, but uh, the basic conclusion is that's not where Bumandala is. And of course, another problem there is the local horizon changes depending on your latitude uh, because you're on, a, on the surface of the globe. So, there are two main possibilities for the location of Bumandala. One of them is the celestial equator, uh, and the other is the ecliptic, which is the path of the sun. So I'm going to talk about those. Now, if you look at out into the sky at night, you see if it's either one of these two possibilities, then that means Bumandala is at a tilt compared to the plane where we're standing. And that would be true anywhere you, you were on the earth. Depending on where you are on the earth, the tilt will be different. But it tilts. So, if you look at the sky at night, that means that 
planes bisecting the celestial sphere goes up at some angle and cuts across the sky like that. But of course, all we see when we look out into space is stars. We don't see any bisecting uh, entity out there uh, cutting the heavens in half. So the answer I would give to that objection uh, to this whole fifth canto system is that well for us then Blue Mandala is not visible because of its higher dimensional nature. And I would say that we have examples of that in other situations in the in the Bhagavatam. Uh, Kalapagran in the Himalayas is not visible to us. Uh, that's also a material uh, arrangement. Uh, there Kalapagran. That uh, I mentioned the other day is the place where the representatives of the Sun Dynasty and the Moon Dynasty are in uh, yogic trance waiting for the end of Kali Yuga and it's there in the Himalayas I've been told that its location is defined in other Puranas in which Himalayas though? Uh, ours uh, remember Bhakti Prem Swami? hmm well there was back when Srila Prabhupada was here there was a Bhakti Prem Swami uh, who used to be a yogi initially he was called Prem Yogi and uh well, he told me he's been there. <laughs> uh, we can consider the source. But uh, I think it's it's fair to say that it's known where these places are in the Himalayas. Yeah? Uh, if I was just trying to, in order to try to visualize this whole higher dimensional thing, I, I was trying to bring everything down to like a two dimension to two dimensions so we can see what would happen in a like comparison what would be going on in the third to a two dimensional person yeah. so we can compare how something in the fourth dimension might yeah. compare to us in the third so if you were to draw like a, a circle and then imagine a line going to the center of that circle but not in the plane of the blackboard mm-hmm. then th- that that would be comparable to the 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 uh uh, Umandal being out there in a different dimension, so we can't see it at night. Mm-hmm. But that, that, but you, so, so therefore you can, you know, that's why you can see all around 360 degrees all yeah. around. But so similarly, you're in the center of that circle on the blackboard. You're looking all around. You, you, you only can look in two dimensions. Yeah. You're not seeing that line. It's in the third dimension. Right. At all. But it's not even. It's not there. So you're saying the Umandal is actually there, but it's invisible. Yeah, let me clarify your example, because it, it still is there in that example. Uh, I gave this example in the book, and I'll explain it at some length, because it, it addresses just the point that you're making. Because I'm proposing that something that is there in a higher dimensional sense will also have three-dimensional location. And in order to go to it, you have to go to its two-dimensional location and travel to its higher dimensional location. Now, the example that I gave in the book is a two-dimensional example. So suppose you want to go to a certain office in New York City. So you're given the street address. So let's say it's a certain street and a certain avenue. So if you go there on that two-dimensional grid to that address, you may find that you can't find the office. In order to reach the actual office, you have to move to the third dimension going up to, say, the 50th floor of the building, and then you find the office. So the point is, it has a two-dimensional address. Uh, To get to it, you have to first go to the two-dimensional address and then go up. Of course, you could go up in a helicopter and go across and also reach it that way. Uh, That's also possible. But even there, there you're going to the third dimension first and then going to the two-dimensional address because you're still hovering over the same intersection of street and avenue once you get there. So it has a two-dimensional address which you need in order to get to it, and it has a third-dimensional position. So to really get to it, you have to move to the third dimension also. That's like the comment of rivers on this planet as well as the heavenly planets having the same name? Well, it is possible that a river on this planet can have a higher dimensional uh, existence. Uh, and of course we have examples where that would have to be true practically for the Vedic literature to work out take the Ganges there's the Ganges that we know that you can bathe in Uh, that is coming down uh, from the top of Mount Meru 
uh, and it's, it lands on the head of Lord Shiva, who's collecting the waters, breaking its fall, and then it tumbles down and comes down into uh, the area where we can see it. Now, in terms of our experience, from what I understand, the Ganges issues out of a, uh, a spring or cave-like region somewhere up in the Himalayas. There's a BCG article about it once. So, it looks, from our perspective, as though it's completely a river of this earth with a source in a certain location that you can go to. But it's described that it's coming down from the top of Mount Meru. Prior to that, it came down from the moon. And prior to that, it came down from the Sapta Loka uh, planets, the seven rishis, and so on. So, that would have to be a higher dimensional transformation in which finally it becomes manifest within our vision. Uh, so similarly with all of these uh, things. So the uh, example then of the, uh, the streets and the uh, third dimensional location of this office would, if you apply that to Bhumandala, the idea would be that uh, Bhumandala would have its three dimensional location but to actually see what is there, you have to travel in the third dimension as well. I mean, the higher dimension as well. <coughs> so that's the, the idea. That it makes sense to talk about the three-dimensional position of a higher dimensional uh, system. But the sun is visible. But the sun is visible. And it's just there at the same distance of, uh, at the top of that mountain. So uh, yeah. Um, so we have other examples of that. Uh, there are, well, of course, the one I already gave, a Pelopogram, is one such example. The mountains that it's on are visible to us. The place itself is not. It's a spiritual example, of course, that Vrindavan, as a uh, place where the surrounding landscape is visible to us, we know where to go on the earth to reach it, but you have to go into a higher dimension, so to speak, this time to a spiritual level, to see the of Vrindavan there, or the actual spiritual Vrindavan that is there. So, and if you think about that example, again, as far as I can see, you have to go to the three-dimensional place also in order to get there because otherwise one could say, well, you could go to Cincinnati and that would be Vrindavan too if you had the right level of realization, but that's not what you read in the scriptures. You're told that, well, there's 32 crochets of land in one region. That's where the uh, spiritual Vrindavan is uh, on the earth. So the basic idea there is you can have a higher dimensional uh, system which also has a three dimensional location. Uh, another example which is interesting, we were talking about this last night, in the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam it describes that 100 yojanas above the level of the earth of course, when it says Earth, it's, it's meaning Bhumandala. But presumably 100 yojin is up would also mean 100 yojin is up from us. At 8 miles per yojin, that would be 800 miles up. There are worlds inhabited by a whole list of beings. Uh, these are Rakshashas, Yakshas, and um, Bhutas and Kretas and so forth. They're all rather demonic types of beings. So they live about 800 miles up, according to this. And if you go still further up, it doesn't say how, how far, but just a little bit further up, uh, you come to another strata inhabited by uh, Siddhas, Charanas, and Vidyaras, and other beings like that. So, to us, if you look up there, it seems like empty space, but they're living there. And living there means they have their abodes, uh, they have their vehicles, their roads and houses and, and everything that you need in order to live. So that's there, but we don't see it. So that means it's given a three-dimensional location in the Bhagavatam, uh, so we can say, well, it's up there at that distance, but uh, it's definitely not visible to us. So that would be another example. Yet another example would be the civilization on the moon. Mm. Of course, that's the whole issue, did we go to the moon or not? But the same thing could be applied there. Uh, I'm going to talk about the moon later on, though. So, 
Uh, let me continue with this. So, yeah? How do you split the example given by, I think his name is Abbott, who wrote Flatlands? Mm -hmm. How do you split the, uh, the setup he has there for understanding this? Well, he had some interesting ideas there. He can use his analogies. There's this book called Flatland, which uh, was actually a political satire, I think, pretty much. <coughs> but you have this two-dimensional world with two-dimensional beings living in it, and they can only understand two dimensions. And it describes what happened when a three-dimensional being visited that world. The three-dimensional being was described as a sphere, just the simplicity. So when he visited that world, it looked as though a point suddenly appeared and then expanded into a circle. Uh, and then when he left, the circle shrank down to a point again and vanished. So from the point of, being, of view of the beings in Flatland, uh, this circle being seemed to have amazing powers because it could appear at one place, then disappear, then appear in another place. Uh, but from the point of view of the sphere being who was three-dimensional, he was just moving around like that. So uh, there are analogies like that. Uh, of course, we have so many appearances and disappearances in the, in the Vedic literature. Uh, Let's see. Pardon me? Would there be some, uh, some, uh, or there's going to be quite a bit of systems like, uh, there be, uh, all these UFOs and UFOs and all that. Uh, we'll discuss that. Uh, that'll come up later. But uh, we have some material on that also. So what I want to do now is discuss the path of the sun in Bhu Mandala. So uh, in the fifth canto, I brought this along here. I'm not going to try to discuss all the details that are there in the book that you can read gradually. But I wanted to discuss a couple of uh, interesting verses which re refer to the... Uh, movement of the sun. So this one verse says the following thing. Actually, these aren't really verses. The fifth canto is mainly in prose. Uh, so it says, the chariot of the sun god has only one wheel, which is known as Samvatsara. The twelve months are calculated to be its twelve spokes. The six seasons are the sections of its ring, rim. And the three chakra masya periods are its three-section hub. One side of the axle carrying the wheel rests upon the summit of Mount Sumeru, and the other rests upon Manasotra Mountain. Affixed to the outer end of the axle, the wheel continuously rotates on Manasotra Mountain like the wheel of, a, of an oil pressing machine. So, I'll try and make a drawing of, uh, of what this is saying. Uh, if you look at, well, let's see, the best thing to do, I guess, is Look at this from the side. So this ellipse would be uh, the ring of, Mon of Manasotra Mountain seen from the side. John would read this descent. I'm drawing this completely out of scale. This uh, Mount Sumeru would be in the center of this. So what you have is an axle going from there to a wheel. So this is the wheel. The axle goes out like that. So the idea is that uh, this wheel is rotating on top of Mount Meru, going around in a circular track. Uh, and the axle is supported by the wheel at this end and at the top of Mount Meru at the other end. So that's the description that's given. So, this is compared here to an oil pressing machine. We call it a Tyla Yantra. So, I've never actually seen one. Has anyone seen one of these? You've seen? Yeah. But uh, you can see what the oil pressing machine is. It consists of a heavy wheel with an axle going to a central uh, stabilizer. An oxen will pull that and it goes around in a continuous circle and you put, say, um, something you want to press oil out of. Some mustard seeds. Sesame seeds. Sesame seeds. So it just keeps crushing them as it goes around in a circle, and this way you get the oil from the seeds. 
So that's how it's being described. And the sun is located here. How exactly it's situated with respect to the wheel, I'm not sure, but it's out at this end of the axle. So the idea is this goes around and carries the sun around. Now, if you look at it in terms of the, the proper scale, um, the thing to notice is that in the Bhagavatam you'll find that the sun is above the plane of Bhumangala by uh, 100,000 yojanas. That's how high it is above that plane. And this distance from the center out to where the sun is, that is out from Anasogra Mountain, was uh, 157.5 thousand yojanas. 100,000 is a lakh of yojanas. So the point is, the distance out to the sun is much greater than the distance from the, the sun up to Bumandala. So, and we're at the center somewhere in here. So that means that to us, the sun has to be very close to Bumandala. Because you can imagine, let's say if you had a rod 157 feet long and the wheel kept a, a light bulb up one foot and the thing was rotating on a plane, it would be practically in the plane. So that's the, the scale of this uh, situation. So that means that to know where Bumandala is, you have to ask where the sun is. Because the path the sun follows is right next to Bumandala like this. So the uh, basic idea then is that this verse... What's the height of Severo again? 80,000? Uh, 84,000 uh, 84, yojanas. So it's not slightly higher than the... Yeah, well, it fits in, yeah. basically, in terms of the dimensions of these things. So, uh, what this does is support the idea that the Bhumandala disk corresponds to the path of the sun. Uh, so, there are two ways in which the sun moves. Uh, we have 15 minutes here two basic motions and uh, one of these is the daily motion that you see uh, from sunrise to sunset and, and back around again and the other is the yearly motion which I described against the background of the celestial sphere so uh, if you take this motion to be the yearly motion then what you get is the uh, this thing goes around in one year on this circle. Where the sun is is where Bumangala is. The sun goes around the ecliptic once in a year. So that, if you think about it, it pins down Bumangala to be in the plane of the ecliptic. That's where Bumangala would have to be. So that would be how you figure the location. Now there are descriptions here which are uh, it's a little bit more complicated than this, though. The same ecliptic that we looked at here. Yeah. That's the plane of Bumandala. That would be where the plane of Bumandala is. Yeah? So that means gravity is acting sideways. Well, gravity is another whole topic. <laughs> How you relate all these things to questions of gravity. By the way, there's a whole section in the book later on on the whole subject of gravity, which is a whole issue. Yeah. What about the idea of the Earth going around the Sun in a year? Ah, well that's what we discussed on the first day here. Uh, namely the heliocentric versus the geocentric viewpoint. Actually, in that discussion, uh, I was pointing out, of course, that the uh, Jyotisha Shastra presents things from a geocentric perspective. So the Earth is the fixed point and things move around it, the Sun and the Moon and so forth whereas modern astronomy takes the heliocentric viewpoint. And the main reason, intuitively, that people tend to be convinced that the Earth must be going around the Sun rather than the other way around is that the Sun is so massive compared to the Earth that if the Sun is going around the Earth, it's like the tail wagging the dog, basically. It makes more sense to think 
tiny Earth is going around the big sun. Now, you can sort of see here some indication as to why the same argument would favor a geocentric point of view in the context of the Bhagavatam, because here the sun is, big though it is, is relatively small compared with this Earth structure that we're talking about. Uh, of course, then comes the question of, of gravity. If you take a naive model and you fill out all the space in the plane between the Earth and the Sun with mass, that's going to have some incredible gravitational field. And in terms of ordinary physics, things just wouldn't work out. There's no, there's no big evidence for the existence of gravity, is there? Yeah, that's another whole topic. Shula Prabhupada says some things about gravity. Uh, and, huh? We do an anticipation of your sitting on the hoods of an Well, he makes a number of comments. Uh, I could look this up, but it's, it's later on in the book. Basically, the point that Shula Prabhupada makes is the, the greatest concession he makes to the law of gravity is that, uh, what's really happening is not according to the law of gravity, but you can name it as such. If you, if you want. But the thing that's really going on is, is something quite different. Of course, it's described that Ananta Shesha is holding the, the planets and, and so forth. Well, there are two basic descriptions of what is causing the planets to move in their particular orbits. One is the idea of Ananta Shesha. The other is the idea of things being moved by wind. There's something called the Prabaha wind, which is moving the planets around. Uh, Srila Prabhupada refers to both of those. Yeah? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so that is one. Let's see. Uh, the next thing I had was, okay, I'll turn to this. 302. Uh, on page 302 of the, the Bhagavatam, there's another long description here and basically Srila Prabhupada says in the purport which is actually shorter than the, the section of text itself uh, he says the sun orbits around Mount Sumeru for six months on the northern side and for six months on the southern this adds up to the duration of the day and night of the demigods in the upper planetary systems so that's what Srila Prabhupada says there by the way the uh Bhu Mandala has a system of directions like this. If this is Jambagrip in the center, then you have north and uh, south and east and west like this. Uh, in other words, the center point, you still have directions going out from it, north, south, east, and west. But in the Krishna book section that you read, north was described as going up. Uh, yeah, I said that. There's uh, north to the, the pole star, and uh, it stands to reason that uh, Krishna and Arjuna were going through Satyaloka toward the pole star. Where did an angle come from? The surface of our Earth is at an angle. Yeah, the surface of our Earth is at an angle. But the point I'm making here is that Bhumandala itself, that plane, has its own system of directions, and it's arranged like this. So, on the Earth globe, the system of directions changes depending on where you are. If you're at the North Pole, then every direction is south. And so, uh, if you're a little bit south on one of those lines, then North is toward the North Pole. If someone goes south the other way, North is toward the North Pole. So, their Norths point right at one another. Uh, as you can see in very northern countries, North for them points right over the top of the globe toward one another. So that's the way it is on the globe. You have a different coordinate system for directions at different points. But Bhumandala is given one coordinate system uh, for north, south, east, and west. What was the point that you made just prior to putting this out? I didn't catch it. The point I made just prior to that, uh, this was, I did this to illustrate, to illuminate this purport of Srila Prabhupada that I read, where he said, the sun orbits around Mount Meru for six months on the northern side and for six months on the southern side. That was the, the point there. So, uh, what I'd finally like to get to, well, we'll probably talk about this more uh, on other days, is 
the uh, now the other planets. Uh, so in the Srimad Bhagavatam, apart from the, the sun and the moon, there's uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and Rahu. And other Vedic literatures describe Ketu uh, also. But the Bhagavatam doesn't, as far as I can see. But in any case, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto aren't mentioned. Uh, this is also the case for the Jyotisha Shastra. Uh, the same plants are there without Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Uh, curiously enough, this Bhumandala disk, if you take it all the way out, it goes out to three times the radius of the orbit of Saturn, according to modern calculations. But it wouldn't include Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, curiously enough. Anyway, uh, discussion of distances is another whole uh, topic to go into. But what I want to talk about now is where these planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, and so forth, are located. So the basic description given in the Bhagavatam is that these planets are at various heights above Bhumandala. So to make a horizontal picture again, If this is Bhumandala, then the planets are given as having various heights above it. And there's a table in the book, which is on page 85, in which these heights are given. <coughs> now, it would appear that in the fifth canto, as we have it, there's some uh, misprints there concerning these heights. And I mentioned that in this table. Uh, these particular numbers in this table 8 are given based on the following considerations uh, in the Bhagavatam the earth sun distance the height of the sun is given as 100,000 uh, yojanas above uh, Rumandala so that's also confirmed in various other places then in the different verses it gives the height from one planet to the next going up. So if you then add those numbers one upon another, you get the values here. By the way, in this table, I'm just using 8 miles per yojana. So you see the first figure here is 800,000 miles and so forth. So uh, you have this uh, sequence of planets and the lowest one here is the sun. The next one is the moon. And then we have uh, Venus, Mercury, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Does the figure for the moon correspond with modern calculation? Oh, uh, between the Earth and the moon? Not exactly. And I'm going to show, though, a very interesting thing that emerges if you look at all of the planets as a group. The figure for the moon does not particularly correspond to any modern figures. But you find some very interesting things, though, nonetheless. And I'm just build up to that. So this is the system. It's like a stack of horizontal levels, like phonograph records on a stack. Basically, if you look at these numbers, the highest one is Saturn, which is uh, 11 million miles, roughly. Now, keep in mind that the distance from the center out to where the sun is was 126 million miles. That's the radius from the center out to Manasotara Mountain. So, uh, yeah, here it is. We're using this figure right here, because we're using 8 miles per yojana. So, from the center out to the sun is 126 million miles. And as you can see in this table, Saturn, which is the highest one, is 11 million miles, which is small compared to that. So they're really close to this plane. Uh, they don't go very far above it. So that is what you get from the Bhagavatam. Now, on the next page, I have another calculation, <coughs> which is kind of interesting. This is based entirely on modern astronomy. What I did was the following thing. 
take the plane of the ecliptic and ask how far each planet goes away from the plane of the ecliptic in the course of its orbit. Now, the thing to realize here is that uh, the planets move in different orbits, and these correspond to different planes. Uh, just as, from a geocentric point of view, the uh, sun's orbit around the Earth, that makes one plane. The moon's orbit around the Earth makes a different plane, and that tilts with respect to the first plane. And the same is true of all the different planets. Uh, and I was describing actually on the first day how the Surya Siddhanta also discusses this. Uh, it gives, for that second epicycle, it gives the tilts of the different planes. So, since the plane for a given planet tilts compared with the plane of the ecliptic, and the planet is moving in a roughly circular orbit in the ecliptic. Now this is using modern astronomy, so it's actually an ellipse, elliptical orbit. That means the planet is going to go to a, a furthest point away from the plane of the ecliptic in the course of its orbit. And so what is that value? You can calculate that using the orbital data that they have. So in table nine on the next page, page 86, we see the results of that calculation. And we have a table of uh, the planets in increasing order of distance according to those calculations. The thing that is interesting is that although these figures are not exactly the same as the figures that you see on table 8 on page 85, they're in the same ballpark. They're of the same order of magnitude. And the order that you get for the distances of the planets from the ecliptic is the same is the order that you get in the Bhagavatam. Namely, it's the Sun, the Moon, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. You get that same order. Really? Hmm? Mercury and Mars are pretty close. Yep, Mercury and Mars is close, <laughs> but it is the same order. <laughs> That's true. So, uh, Saturn goes the furthest out here, actually. 38 million instead of 11 million. But then Jupiter is 11 million, and over here it's 9.6 million. So it's rough, but it's in the same ballpark, basically. So uh, what this, uh, what I'm suggesting is that then the basic picture in the fifth canto is consistent with the picture of how the planets are related to the ecliptic in modern astronomy. Now, it's not exactly the same, because in the Bhagavatam it just says these planets are at different heights above the Mandala. Whereas in modern astronomy, because they're on these tilted orbits, they go above and below as they go around. And so they cross over at a certain point. So it's uh, somewhat different, but at the same time there's this basic uh, agreement. So, but they're also measuring from uh, Mount Sinaver, in other words, by our, by where the, where the Earth globe is. They're measuring from Bar Barsap, they're measuring from the center, yeah. as opposed to the, from the plane of the Mundra. But what I'm calculating in Table 9 is, in fact, the uh, distances reached from the plane of Bumandala. Not the plane of Bumandala, rather, but the ecliptic. In other words, the calculation. Okay. Yeah. Here's how, it, here's how it's done. If here's the Earth, and here's the Sun, this is the way you do it in the Western system, and another planet goes on a plane, uh-oh, <laughs> we're supposed to end. <laughs> we really should. Uh, we'll resume like ourselves. You can call you. Yeah, like in Kali Yuga. Yeah? So is this... Um you're saying that the, the karmic, somebody say karmic um, bank account for their, how much karma they have kind of grows in quantum because everyone on this planet is experiencing the planet as a sphere. Mm -hmm. It says that everyone on this planet must fall into the same category of some certain range of karma in yeah. order to be having this level of sense perception. Yes, that, that would be correct. There's group karma, you might say. And it does go by quantum quantum jumps. 
and the point where the quantum jump is made is when you die and get another body. Uh, because depending on the karma that you've accrued in the course of one lifetime, at the time of death you could be promoted to a higher planet. So in effect you make a quantum leap at that point, or you could be demoted to a lower one. So it's not exactly that there's a continuum of possibilities. There are quantum jumps there. Yeah? Uh, if, if, the, if the Earth planet, if you know it as a, a, a surface, um, if that's like you were describing, then what happens in, in the other part of the Bharata of, uh, the other part of the Sun circle? How is it? Um, um, how is it situated? Or, or there are there inhab inhabitants? And, because like, they are distributed the of the Bharata of the other. Yes. So the Bhagavatam describes all the Varshas in terms of this basic geographical structure shown here. So I've made the point thus far that at least part of that, namely part of Bharat Varsha, can be experienced by its inhabitants as being a globe detached from everything else. Now, it is interesting that Srila Prabhupada uses this kind of description for all of Bhumandala. And uh, I collected together examples of that. Basically, we see how Bhumandala is described in the Bhagavatam. That's what we're discussing here. Srila Prabhupada describes it as a system of globes. And since that is an interesting point, let me look at the page reference where I have that discussed. Hmm. I would have thought that I had good notes here. Here we go. 71 through 72 in the book. There's a section called Planets as Globes in Space. <clears throat> so, uh, Srila Prabhupada refers to the whole system in terms of globes in space, and I have well, about seven different references here. Uh, yeah? That idea, of, um, the idea that it's several pages of globes in space and all that uh, communication between this Earth planet and the seven dvipas is still going on today, according to the Chaitanya Charitamrita. You can read there that uh, human beings, uh, not human beings, but beings from the different dvipas of Sakta Dvip visited Lord Chaitanya during his pastimes disguised as human beings. So these kinds of things are going on. As far as this idea of a principle of correspondence is concerned, let's see here. Some of the things that I just mentioned are listed here or discussed on page 57. Where were these other things? One thing I wanted to discuss that was interesting to me is the idea that rivers on the earth have celestial counterparts. Srila Prabhupada in one place, this was in a uh, purport in the section of the Bhagavatam discussing the uh, slaying of Ritrasura. He pointed out that all of the different major rivers flowing in India, uh, not just the Ganges, but the Narmada River and various others, uh, have their counterparts in the heavenly planets. So there were descriptions of battles that took place on the heavenly planets along the shores of rivers, but those rivers are in India. So the uh, basic thesis that I would propose is that the uh, total structure that you have here is this structure described briefly in the fifth canto, but this can be seen at different levels of perception in different ways. Uh, there are more limited levels of perception and uh, more expansive levels, uh, which depend then on the karmic situation of the individuals. And also the cycle of the yugas can be involved in this, this being Kali Yuga. So in this way, you have the, uh, the earth being experienced by us as a small globe, but in a higher dimensional sense that is connected to this larger structure of Bhumandala. The basic thesis that I'm proposing is that uh, Bhu Mandala is a description of the universe as seen from the point of view of the demigods and rishis and so forth. And 
the small earth globe as we know it and as described in the Jyotisha Shastras corresponds to the earth in the experience of ordinary human beings like ourselves. In Kali Yuga. Yeah, like in Kali Yuga. Yeah? So is this, um, you're saying that, ka- that the karmic, somebody should say karmic um, bank account for their physics, things just wouldn't work out. This is no, there's no big evidence for the existence of gravity, is there? Yeah, that's another whole topic. Srila Prabhupada says some things about gravity. Uh, and, huh? Well, he makes a number of comments. Uh, I could look this up, but it's, it's later on in the book. Basically, the point that Srila Prabhupada makes is the, the greatest concession he makes to the law of gravity is that uh, what's really happening is not according to the law of gravity, but you can name it as such. If you if you want, but the thing that's really going on is is something quite different. Yeah. Of course, it's described that Ananta Shesha is holding the the planets and and so forth. Well, there are two basic descriptions of what is causing the planets to move in their particular orbits. One is the idea of Ananta Shesha. The other is the idea of things being moved by wind. There's something called the Prabhaha wind, which is moving the planets around. Uh, Srila Prabhupada refers to both of those. Yeah? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so that is one. Let's see. Uh, the next thing I had was, okay, I'll turn to this. 302. Uh, on page 302 of the, the Bhagavatam, there's another long description here and basically Srila Prabhupada says in the purport which is actually shorter than the the section of text itself uh, he says the sun orbits around Mount Sumeru for six months on the northern side and for six months on the southern this adds up to the duration of the day and night of the demigods in the upper planetary systems so that's what Srila Prabhupada says there by the way the uh Bhu Mandala has a system of directions like this. If this is Jambagrip in the center, then you have north and uh, south and east and west like this. Uh, in other words, the center point, you still have directions going out from it, north, south, east, and west. But in the Krishna book section that you read, north was described as going up. Uh, yeah, I said that. There's uh, north to the, the pole star, and uh, it stands to reason that uh, Krishna and Arjuna were going through Satyaloka toward the pole star. We're at an angle. Uh, the surface of our Earth is at an angle. Yeah, the surface of our Earth is at an angle. But the point I'm making here is that Bhumangala itself, that plane, has its own system of directions, and it's arranged like this you'll see a mountain range that goes from A to B, marked there. The height of that mountain range is about twice the diameter of the Earth as we know it. Uh, it's a mountain range that's, uh, well, it's uh, 2,000 yojanas high, and 8 miles per yojana means it's 16,000 miles high. The diameter of the Earth is about 8,000 miles. So that's the height of that mountain range. So this uh, Buma, this Jambugli structure is enormous in comparison. Now in order to understand Bhu Mandala, uh, certainly uh, our location has something to do with Bhu Mandala, that much you can say, because in Bhu Mandala there's something called Bharata Varsha. And uh, so there are nine Varshas in Bhu Mandala which are divided by these different mountain ranges. And actually there's this central square region that you can see that has Mount Meru growing up from it. That's called the Labata Varsha. And if you count the divisions made by these mountain ranges, counting that square as one of them, you'll see that there are nine. And Bhumadala is shown more closely on page 55 to be a sort of semicircular region on the southern uh, side of this disk. So that is the, the description that is given. Now, in the Bhagavatam, 
it is described that the inhabitants of the Varshas other than Bhumandala are all um, beings similar to demigods. It's described that they're not quite demigods. Actually, they are persons who had nearly exhausted their karma on the heavenly planets. They were demigods. So having nearly exhausted their karma, they come down to these other dvipas of uh, other varshas of Jambudvi, but they still have basically uh, good karma to exhaust. So they, it's said that they live for 10,000 years and their bodies do not show symptoms of old age uh, and bad odor and so on and so forth. Uh, also, uh, the, these varshas are generally playgrounds for the demigods. All kinds of events involving the, the demigods take place there, including a lot of different things mentioned in the Mahabharata, for example. So these regions are not exactly earthly. Uh, they're more like celestial domains. And it's described that the uh, Kali Yuga does not have a real impact in these other Varshas. Uh, in general, the Kali Yuga only affects Bharata Varsha uh, in outer space. And so there are... Uh, oh, here's one. This one is interesting. Number four here. I'll just read part of it. It says that... Uh, this is in 5.1, five, five, fifth canto part 1. But uh, as Priyabrata drove his chariot behind the sun, he created seven different types of oceans and planetary systems, which all together are known as Bhumandala or Bhuloka. And there again he was saying, sometimes the planets in outer space are called islands. Uh, and these are islands in the ocean of space. So it's basically the idea here of a planet as an island floating in the ocean of air or the ocean of space. Uh, he explicitly refers to them as globes also. Uh, there are some other references here. So this gives, in a way, this all adds up into a sort of unified picture of things. If you consider that you have the uh, description of this Bhumandala system, Bhagavatam, described in this way, including Jambudvi, and that is also understandable as a series of globes or a system of planets floating in space. So the idea then is that uh, one can make sense out of this in terms of the this higher dimensional uh, concept. Yeah? Um, the geography of Blue Mandala with the circular rings mm -hmm. and like islands and so on suggests the idea that um, the system of globes would be nest, nested one inside the other with a common center. I'm sure you must have thought of that and dismissed it as a possibility. Well, I thought of it, but uh, what I thought was I can't really do much more with it in the sense that I don't have any information to go on there. But, you see, basically we have somewhat limited information. Uh, at least we have this much information here. Uh, but in terms of the details of how it's all laid out, uh, of course, I don't really know. But, uh, so let's see. So I then wanted to, to go on with the description here. So we have this, okay. Who model of this? which I'm claiming is higher dimensional and it can also be experienced as a series of globes. Uh, but as far as modern observation is concerned, if you look out into space from the Earth, uh, you'll see stars in all directions. You don't see such a system of globes. Of course, there's certain other globes. What I did was the following thing. Take the plane of the ecliptic and ask how far each planet goes away from the plane of the ecliptic in the course of its orbit. Now, the thing to realize here is that uh, the planets move in different orbits, and these correspond to different planes. Uh, just as, from a geocentric point of view, the uh, sun's orbit around the Earth, that makes one plane. 
the moon's orbit around the Earth makes a different plane, and that tilts with respect to the first plane. And the same is true of all the different planets. Uh, and I was describing actually on the first day how the Sirius Vedanta also discusses this. Uh, it gives, for that second epicycle, it gives the tilts of the different planes. So, since the plane for a given planet tilts compared with the plane of the ecliptic, and the planet is moving in a roughly circular orbit in the ecliptic, now this is using modern astronomy, so it's actually an ellipse, elliptical orbit. That means the planet is going to go to a, a furthest point away from the plane of the ecliptic in the course of its orbit. And so what is that value? You can calculate that using the orbital data that they have. So in Table 9 on the next page, page 86, we see the results of that calculation. And we have a table of uh, the planets in increasing order of distance according to those calculations. The thing that is interesting is that although these figures are not exactly the same as the figures that you see on Table 8 on page 85, they're in the same ballpark. They're of the same order of magnitude. And the order that you get for the distances of the planets from the ecliptic is the same as the order that you get in the Bhagavatam. Namely, it's the Sun, the Moon, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. You get that same order. Really? Hmm? Mercury and Mars are pretty close. Yep, Mercury and Mars is close, <laughs> but it is the same order. <laughs> That's true. So, uh, Saturn goes the furthest out here, actually. 38 million instead of 11 million. But then Jupiter is 11 million, and over here it's 9.6 million. So, it's rough, but it's in the same ballpark, basically. So, uh, what this, uh, what I'm suggesting is that then the basic picture in the fifth canto is consistent with the picture of how the planets are related to the ecliptic. I would have thought that I had good notes here. Here we go, 71 through 72 in the book. There's a section called Planets as Globes in Space. So, Srila uh, Prabhupada refers to the whole system in terms of globes in space, and I have well, about seven different references here. Uh, yeah? The idea, um, the idea that it's simultaneous with globes in space and also a plane is similar to the idea of the atom being simultaneously perceived as a particle and a wave in one sense, that has two, two levels of... Uh, yeah, you can make an analogy like that, and that analogy is backed up in one sense because in order to explain the atom in that way, the physicists actually use a higher dimensional scheme. As I was saying yesterday, in quantum mechanics, you use higher dimensional space to define atoms. So that whole wave-particle duality and all the different things you find in quantum mechanics is really expressed in terms of higher dimensions. So, in any event, uh, the idea of, from different points of view, you have either this uh, structure as described in the Bhagavatam, or you have systems of globes. Uh, that is there in Srila Prabhupada's descriptions. Uh, here is one. This is from the Krishna book. I'll just read this. Uh, this is where Arjuna and Krishna were going to visit Maha Vishnu. So it says, seated on his chariot with Arjuna, Krishna began to proceed north, crossing over many planetary systems. I should, by the way, describe where they were traveling. North would mean towards the North Pole Star, which is the direction of Satya Loka. And if you imagine Gu Mandala, then it's spread out beneath them as they travel upwards. So they'll get a panoramic view as they go up. So, Srila Prabhupada says, these are described, the planetary systems, are described in Srimad Bhagavatam as Sapta Dwipa. So that's the Sapta Dwipa. Dwipa means island. These planets are sometimes described in the Vedic literature as Dwipas. The planet on which we are living is called Jambu Dwip. Outer space is taken as a great ocean of air, and within that great ocean of air there are many islands which are the different planets. In each and every planet there are oceans also, and so on. So there he's describing uh, 
some degree in terms of islands in, in the ocean of air. Uh, here's another reference. This is from Chaitanya Char Charitamrita Madhya Lila. There's a reference here. By the way, in reading this book, uh, it's useful if you look up these different references that I have in brackets, because then you'll see what Srila Prabhupada said in the original references. But here's another one. Uh, they don't go very far above it. So that is what you get from the Bhagavatam. Now, on the next page, I have another calculation, <coughs> which is kind of interesting. This is based entirely on modern astronomy. What I did was the following thing. Take the plane of the ecliptic and ask how far each planet goes away from the plane of the ecliptic in the course of its orbit. Now, the thing to realize here is that uh, the planets move in different orbits, and these correspond to different planes. Uh, just as, from a geocentric point of view, the uh, sun's orbit around the Earth, that makes one plane. The moon's orbit around the Earth makes a different plane, and that tilts with respect to the first plane. And the same is true of all the different planets. Uh, and I was describing actually on the first day how the Surya Siddhanta also discusses this. Uh, it gives, for that second epicycle, it gives the tilts of the different planes. So, since the plane for a given planet tilts compared with the plane of the ecliptic, and the planet is moving in a roughly circular orbit in the ecliptic, now, this is using modern astronomy, so it's actually an ellipse, elliptical orbit. That means the planet is going to go to a, a furthest point away from the plane of the ecliptic in the course of its orbit. And so what is that value? You can calculate that using the orbital data that they have. So in Table 9 on the next page, page 86, you see the results of that calculation. And we have a table of uh, the planets in increasing order of distance according to those calculations. The thing that is interesting is that although these figures are not exactly the same as the figures that you see on Table 8 on page 85, they're in the same ballpark. They're of the same order of magnitude. And the order that you get for the distances of the planets from the ecliptic is the same as the order that you get in the Bhagavatam. Namely, it's the Sun, the Moon, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. You get that same order. Really? Hmm? Mercury and Mars are pretty close. Yep, Mercury and Mars is close, <laughs> but it is the same order. <laughs> That's true. So, uh, Saturn goes the furthest out here, actually. 38 million instead of 11 million. But then Jupiter is 11 million, and over here it's 9.6 million. So, it's rough, but it's in the same ballpark, basically. It uh, has access to all of Bhumandala, all seven dwipas. In other cases, it's just Jambudri. In other cases, it's just Bharat Varsha. So in Kali Yuga of today, there's a very limited scope of uh, activity. But in other uh, periods, different yugas and so forth, there was evidently... Uh, a much larger scope of activity to varying degrees. It's also described that specific uh, places on the Earth correspond to uh, places in the higher planets. By the way, Srila Prabhupada uses the term higher planets to refer to this general Jambudweep system. For example, he has spoken of Mount Meru as being on a higher planet. He has spoken of the Gandamandana Hill which forms one of the boundaries between two of these varshas as being on a higher planet and so forth. So, uh, let's see here. Just to illustrate some of this. Uh, interesting point here is that uh, communication between this earth planet and the seven dvipas is still going on today according to the Chaitanya Charitamrita. You can read there that uh, human beings, uh, not human beings, but beings from the different dvipas of Sapta Dvip 
visited Lord Chaitanya during his pastimes disguised as human beings. So these kinds of things are going on. As far as this idea of a principle of correspondence is concerned, let's see here. Some of the things that I just mentioned are listed here or discussed on page 57. Where were these other things? One thing I wanted to discuss that was interesting to me is the idea that rivers on the earth have celestial counterparts. Srila Prabhupada in one place, this was in a uh, purport in the section of the Bhagavatam discussing the uh, slaying of Ritrasura. He pointed out that all of the different major rivers flowing in India, uh, not just the Ganges, but the Narmada River and various others, uh, have their counterparts in the heavenly planets. So there were descriptions of battles that took place on the heavenly planets along the shores of rivers, but those rivers are in India. So the uh, basic thesis that I would propose is that the uh, total structure that you have here is this structure described briefly. I then wanted to, to go on with the descriptions in it. So we have this, okay, Bhumandala disk, which I'm claiming is higher dimensional, and it can also be experienced as a series of globes. Uh, but as far as modern observation is concerned, if you look out into space from the Earth, uh, you'll see stars in all directions. You don't see such a system of globes. Of course, there's certain other globes floating out there, but those are uh, Mercury and Venus and Mars and so forth, and the Sun and the Moon. Uh, there are just a few of them, and they have names. They are also named in the Bhagavatam, so they are not Bhumandala. They are quite distinct from it, because they are separately described in the Bhagavatam. So then where is this Bhumandala? Uh, so that's what I want to discuss next. So if you look into outer space, you see stars in all directions. Can you make clear what you're saying? You're saying Mercury? Venus and Mars are not part of Right, they're not, because they're separately described in the fifth canto. That is, it talks about Venus, Mercury, Mars, and so on, but they're not Bhumandala, they're something different. Uh, so they're all described. Their paths or orbits are described with reference to Bhumandala. And that's what I want to come to. I think I'll be able to get to it today. But you have until six. Yeah, I have until six, right. Yeah. Those planets are described as globes. Oh. Mercury, Mars, etc. Yes. Uh, actually, it doesn't explicitly say that they're they're globes. Although I, I think it's taken for granted in the uh, Surya Siddhanta, they're definitely said to be globes. But the Surya Siddhanta, Surya Siddhanta, treats that that in general. Right. The Bhagavatam refers to them as graha. Uh, the word for those planets is graha. As I was saying before, there are two words that Srila Prabhupada translates as planet generally. Loka is one of them, and Graha is the other. And as I was saying, that, that has astrological significance. It refers to the power of the planet to influence you. It grabs you, is the idea. This is what, I, what I'm thinking is that, although I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be true, it seems like a, within the Puranic view, there maybe should be some consistency of how things are viewed in terms of these disks of land. And within the Jyoti Shastra, there's the consistency of always seeing it as globes in space. Yeah, well, the Purana system has more disks than just the mandala. There are 14 of them. But there might be globes involved in the scene also. Yeah, uh, we're going to be talking about that uh, in some detail. But inside the trailer of the No, it's exactly in the middle of Pushkara Dweep which is inside the clear water ocean. So what you have is the clear water ocean and then Pushkara Dweep and halfway across Pushkara Dweep radially is Manasotra Mountain, which is a ring going all the way around. So going inwards, you have successive oceans and mountains 
and each one is half as you go in. Each pair of oceans and mountains has half the width of the preceding one. Until finally, you come down to Plakshadweep, which is the smallest ring-shaped island. Within that is the saltwater ocean, which is the smallest ring-shaped ocean. And then in the center of that, there's a circular island called Jambudweep. And we were looking yesterday in the pictures, the computer-generated pictures in the book, which show what Jambudweep looks like. So the main point is that on the scale of this picture, Jambudweep here is very tiny, just like a tiny region in the center of this large structure. Actually, that's half, that, what you've drawn those two braces there, that's actually half of that one. Yeah, I haven't drawn it to scale. A little, yeah. little more than half, either. Yeah, I haven't drawn it to scale. To give the, the figures correctly, from Mount Manasotara, which is here, to give the scale, there's 9.6 million Yojanas between Manasotara Mountain and the outer edge of the Clearwater Ocean. And from Manasotara Mountain, to the center, which is Jambu, the center of Jambudri, which would be the center of Mount Meru, there's once again 15.75 uh, million yojanas. So you can see this is, you know, uh, about two thirds of this. So I haven't drawn it to proper scale, but that is the uh, the arrangement. So uh, at this point, there's a, an interesting observation to make. Uh, concerning the scale of this system, and that is that the Bhagavatam pretty much has the distance from the Earth, which is at the center. Uh, we'll be discussing how uh, our location would be in Bharat Varsha in Jammu, so we would be located near the center of this whole structure. So the distance then from the Earth to the Sun the Earth as we know it to the Sun. Of course, I should emphasize in the Bhagavatam, this whole thing is the Earth. But the Earth as a small planet, as we experience, the distance from that to the Sun, would be given here as uh, 15.75 uh, million uh, Yojanas. Now, if you use this holding the, the planets and, and so forth, well, there are two basic descriptions of what is causing the planets to move in their particular orbits. One is the idea of anantashesha. The other is the idea of things being moved by wind. There's something called the Prabhaha wind, which is moving the planets around. Uh, Srila Prabhupada refers to both of those. Yeah? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so that is one. Let's see. Uh, the next thing I had was Okay, I'll turn to this, 302. Uh, on page 302 of the, the Bhagavatam, there's another long description here. And basically, Srila Prabhupada says in the purport, which is actually shorter than the, the section of text itself, uh, he says, The sun orbits around Mount Sumeru for six months on the northern side and for six months on the southern this adds up to the duration of the day and night of the demigods in the upper planetary systems. So, that's what Srila Prabhupada says there. By the way, the uh, Bhu Mandala has a system of directions like this. If this is Jambudweep in the center, then you have north and uh, south and east and west like this. Uh, in other words, the center point you still have directions going out from it, north, south, east, and west. But in the Krishna book section that you read, north was described as going up. Uh, yeah, I said that. There's uh, north to the, the pole star, and uh, it stands to reason that uh, Krishna and Arjuna were going through Satyavoka toward the pole star. We're at an angle. Up. The, one the surface of our earth is at an angle. Yeah, the surface of our earth is at an angle. But the point I'm making here is that Bhumangala itself, that plane, has its own system of directions. And it's arranged like this. So on the Earth globe, the system of directions changes depending on where you are. If you're at the North Pole, then every direction is south. And so 
Uh, if you're a little bit south on one of those lines, then north is toward the North Pole. Someone goes south the other way, north is toward the North Pole. So their norths point right at one another. Uh, as you can see in very northern countries, north for them points right over the top of the globe toward one another. So that's the way it is on the globe. You have a different coordinate system for directions at different points. But Bumandala is given one coordinate system as in our Sampradaya. So this Bamsidar is an, an example of that. And as you can see in his presentation, this uh, was a controversial question at that time. Uh, people were perplexed about it. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, solutions to this problem that he mentioned there is that you should use the principle of uh, anirvachaniya, which we've uh, heard of in another context. Uh, he just mentions that as one of a list of different explanations. So the main point is that this issue was being discussed back in the uh, early 1600s, uh, which is the time when he was living. And that's about apparently the time of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Do we have any dates on Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur? Yeah. I just wonder what his exact dates might be. So we were speaking about the cosmic scale of Bhumandala. So uh, I want to give some presentation of that. Oh, we have an eraser. Oh, it seems we have a, uh, an artistic tesseract here. Uh, this is what it should look like. Four-dimensional uh, cube or hypercube. We also have a one-dimensional simulation of one-dimensional space. <laughs> anyway, so what I want to do is uh, give some idea of the uh, scale of this uh, room mandala. And I'm going to try to do this with some drawings here. See how well this works. This is a cross-section of room mandala. And this is the center. So this is Jamudweep right here. This is radially going out. So you imagine this extends on the other side also. So the, uh, to get an idea of the dimensions, if we, from here out to here, is about uh, 250 million uh, yojanas or about 2 billion miles, using 8 miles per yojana. So that's the distance from here to the outer edge. That's the radius of the Bumandala disk. That's the radius of the Bumandala disk. So, because the diameter would be 500 million yojanas, or 4 billion miles. So halfway, there's something called the Loka Loka Mountain. Now, Bumandala is Everything in Bhumandala is arranged in, in circular form. This field of Jyotish Shastra uh, have generally shown a lack of appreciation of the fifth canto description of the universe. Uh, for example, this uh, Parameshwara uh, said that the seven dvipas, as we're describing here, are only for religious meditation. <laughs> said, well, they're not real. Uh, as for Mount Meru, he said it's not acceptable to astronomers. Uh, and there are some other uh, cases like that. This is the Siddhanta Shiromani by this Bhaskar Acharya. And he, for example, is describing here how they measure the uh, circumference of the Earth. Uh, this tells how they would actually do it in India. Uh, he's saying specifically that you would measure the uh, distance from Ujjain to a point to the south of that and see the change in the angle of the sun. Ujjain, by the way, is the prime meridian uh, used by the uh, Indian astronomers. Just like Greenwich in England marks the prime meridian uh, in modern astronomy. So you uh, measure uh, a distance going north-south and you see how much the angle of the sun changes if you cr cover that distance uh, at a given date. And 
based on that, you can calculate the circumference of the Earth. The way it works is this. If uh, this is the Earth, the sphere, and sunlight is coming down in parallel rays, <coughs> so if you, if this is the center, let's say the way I've drawn it right here, the sun at this time would be right overhead. And here the sun at this time would be at this angle, which must be the same as this angle. If you uh, measure this distance along the surface of the Earth, and you know this angle, then you can find what the radius of the Earth is. So that's the method that they used. So he's describing that method, and he gives the figure, uh, which agrees pretty much with the, the modern figure for the diameter of the Earth. And then he says, what reason then is there in attributing, as the Puranikas do, such an immense magnitude to the Earth? As he's referring to this description of Umandala. So uh, there was also a lack of understanding on their part of the situation of Bumandala. So what I want to do today is go step by step to explain the situation of Bumandala. So, Can I ask yeah, quickly, the, uh, a region of inhabited land. Let's see. This you divide this up. It's about like this in proportion. This would be. Uh, okay, 15.75 million uh, yojanas. Uh, this is the region from the outer edge of the clear water ocean to the beginning of the golden land, and that's called inhabited land. That's the description that's given. So that's yet another circle. Then, the Sanskrit terms for these uh, divisions also? Yes, they're all in the in the Bhagavatam. Uh, apart from, yeah, you can look them, them up. I don't know them right offhand. So, this point here, at the beginning of this, is the far shore of the clear water ocean. So now, to describe what's going on inside here, uh, one has to expand out this diagram. Uh, so now this point becomes the same as, as this point. We've expanded the scale. So within this radial region, there's the uh, seven dweepas and seven ring-shaped uh, oceans. So uh, the important, really important thing to note is that at a certain point here, in the outer ring, which is called Pushkaragvi, there is a ring-shaped mountain called Manasotara Mountain. So that would be, here, another smaller ring. And this diagram is quite small now. And this is going to be of interest because this ring-shaped Manasotara Mountain is the uh, path followed by the sun. So we're going to be talking about that uh, in some detail. Inside the no, it's exactly in the middle of Pushkaragvi, which is inside the clear water ocean. So what you have is the clear water ocean and then Pushkaragvi and halfway across Pushkaragvi radially is Manasotra Mountain, which is a ring going all the way around. So going inwards, you have successive oceans and mountains. And each one is half as you go in. Each pair of oceans and mountains has half the width of the preceding one. Until finally, you come down to Plakshadwe, which is the smallest ring-shaped island. Within that is the saltwater ocean, which is the smallest ring-shaped ocean. And then the planet is going to go to a, a furthest point away from the plane of the ecliptic in the course of its orbit. And so what is that value? You can calculate that using the orbital data that they have. So in Table 9 on the next page, page 86, we see the results of that calculation. And we have a table of uh, the planets in increasing order of distance according to those calculations. The thing that is interesting is that although 
these figures are not exactly the same as the figures that you see on table 8 on page 85. They're in the same ballpark. They're of the same order of magnitude. And the order that you get for the distances of the planets in the ecliptic is the same as the order that you get in the Bhagavatam. Namely, it's the Sun, the Moon, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. You get that same order. Really? Hmm? Mercury and Mars are pretty close. Yep, Mercury and Mars is close, <laughs> but it is the same order. <laughs> That's true. So, uh, Saturn goes the furthest out here, actually. 38 million instead of 11 million. But then Jupiter is 11 million, and over here it's 9.6 million. So, it's rough, but it's in the same ballpark, basically. So, uh, what this, uh, what I'm suggesting is that then the basic picture in the fifth canto is consistent with the picture of how the planets are related to the ecliptic in modern astronomy. Now, it's not exactly the same, because in the Bhagavatam it just says these planets are at different heights above the Mongolia. Whereas in modern astronomy, because they're on these tilted orbits, they go above and below as they go around. And so they cross over at a certain point. So it's uh, somewhat different, but at the same time there's this basic uh, agreement. So, but they're also measuring from uh, Mount Sumeru, in other words, by, our, by where, the, where the Earth globe is. They're measuring from Bar Barsha, they're measuring from the center, yeah. as opposed to the, from the plane of Bumangra. But what I'm calculating in Table 9 is, in fact, the uh, distances reached from the plane of Bumangra. Not the plane of Bumangra, rather, but the ecliptic. In other words, the calculation... Okay. Yeah. Here's how, it, here's how it's done. If here's the Earth, and here's the Sun, this is the way you do it in the Western system, and another planet goes on a plane, uh-oh, <laughs> we're supposed to end 16,000 miles high. The diameter of the Earth is about 8,000 miles. So that's the height of that mountain range. So this Buma, uh, this Jambudweek structure is enormous in comparison. Now, in order to understand Bu Mandala, uh, certainly uh, our location has something to do with Bu Mandala, that much you can say, because in Bu Mandala there's something called Bharata Varsha. And uh, so there are nine Varshas in Bu Mandala, which are divided by these different mountain ranges. And actually, there's this central square region that you can see that has Mount Meru growing up from it. That's called the Labata Varsha. And if you count the divisions made by these mountain ranges, counting that square as one of them, you'll see that there are nine. And Bhumandala is shown more closely on page 55 to be a sort of semicircular region on the southern uh, side of this disk. So that is the, the description that is given. Now, in the Bhagavatam, it is described that the inhabitants of the Varshas other than Bhu Mandala are all um, beings similar to demigods. It's described that they're not quite demigods. Actually, they are persons who had nearly exhausted their karma on the heavenly planets. They were demigods. So having nearly exhausted their karma, they come down to these other dvipas of uh, other varshas of Jambudvi, but they still have basically uh, good karma to exhaust. So they, it's said that they live for 10,000 years and their bodies do not show symptoms of old age uh, and bad odor and so on and so forth. Uh, also, uh, the, these varshas are generally playgrounds for the demigods. All kinds of events involving the, the demigods take place there, including a lot of different things mentioned in the Mahabharata, for example. So these regions are not exactly earthly. Uh, they're more like celestial domains. 
and it's described that the uh, Kali Yuga does not have a real impact in these other Varshas. Uh, in general, the Kali Yuga only affects Varaka Varsha to a severe degree. It just has a very slight effect in these other regions. Furthermore, it's described that Varaka Varsha is the region where one can uh, uh, accrue karma and where one can attain liberation. Uh, in these other regions, now, Bhumandala is, everything in Bhumandala is arranged in, in circular form. So, if this is Bhumandala and this is the center, and the Loka Loka mountain runs in a circle to the radius path of the radius of uh, Bhumandala. So, it's described that the region out here, between here and here, which would be this region, that's called Aloka Varsha, and it's a region of perpetual darkness. There's no sunlight there, and there are no inhabitants. That's what Aloka means, no people. Yeah, so that's Aloka uh, Varsha. This mountain, uh, Loka Loka Mountain, it's the boundary between the Loka and the Aloka. Hence it has that name. And it blocks the sunlight. That description is given. So that nothing, there's no light out in this region. So if we go in, so this has a distance of, uh, this is another unit, 125 uh, million yojinits. That's that. That's half of the radius. So then, you go into about here, roughly speaking, and there's a region like this. This would be 82.2 million yojinas. This is the region of the Golden Land, it is called. There's an interesting description in the Bhagavatam. So that's another circular region lying within here. So now that's this region. Uh, this is also uninhabited. It's described that the nature of this region is that everything is a blaze of light so that you can't distinguish anything. And no one can live there. That's the, the golden land. It's as though you're living on a surface of polished gold, like a mirror surface. And you can't see anything because of all the, the light. Now, next we come to the... Uh, a region of inhabited land. Let's see. This, you divide this up, it's about like this in proportion. This would be, uh, okay, 15.75 million uh, yojanas. Uh, this is the region from the outer edge of the clear water ocean to the beginning of the golden land, and that's called inhabited land. That's about plants floating in space. So the idea then is that uh, one can make sense out of this in terms of the this higher dimensional uh, concept. Yeah? Um, the geography of Blue Mandala with the circular rings, mm -hmm. and like islands and so on, suggests the idea that um, the system of globes would be nest, nested one inside the other with a common center. I'm sure you must have thought of that and dismissed it as a possibility. Well, I thought of it, but uh, what I thought was I can't really do much more with it in the sense that I don't have any information to go on there. But, you see, basically we have somewhat limited information. Uh, at least we have this much information here. Uh, but in terms of the details of how it's all laid out, uh, of course, I don't really know. But, uh, so let's see. So I then wanted to, to go on with the description here. So we have this, okay. Who model a disk? which I'm claiming is higher dimensional and it can also be experienced as a series of globes. 
Uh, but as far as modern observation is concerned, if you look out into space from the Earth, uh, you'll see stars in all directions. You don't see such a system of globes. Of course, there's certain other globes floating out there, but those are uh, Mercury and Venus and Mars and so forth, and the Sun and the Moon. Uh, there are just a few of them, and they have names. They are also named in the Bhagavatam, so they're not Bhumandala. They're quite distinct from it because they are separately described in the Bhagavatam. So then where is this Bhumandala? Uh, so that's what I want to discuss next. So if you look into outer space, you see stars in all directions. Can you clear what you're saying? You're saying Mercury, Venus, and Mars are not part of Bhumandala? Right, they're not because they're separately described in the fifth canto. That is, it talks about Venus, Mercury, Mars, and so on, but they're not Bhumandala. They're something different. Uh, so they're all described. Their paths or orbits are described with reference to Bhumandala. And that's what I want to come to. I think I'll be able to get to it today. But you have until six. Yeah, I have until six, right. Yeah? Those planets are described as globes. Uh, Mercury, Mars, etc. Yes. Uh, actually, it doesn't explicitly say that they're they're globes, although I. I